Welcome to London Unwrapped, Sounds of a Migrant City, our year-long series exploring London's music story at King's Place, focusing on the part that outsiders and immigrants have always played in driving forward musical culture, from George Frederick Handel to Jimi Hendrix, from Felix Mendelssohn to Anna Meredith. Well, I'm joined by Kevin Legendre, who's a writer, broadcaster, and author of Don't Stop the Carnival, Black Music in Britain. And look, Kevin, it's commonly thought that the story of black music in, in London would begin in the 19th or 20th centuries, but that ignores centuries of black presence in Britain and in London's musical musical life before then. Look, so uh, w w how long is, is the history or uh, is the history of black musicians uh, in London? It all depends how far back you want to go. Um, as far as possible. As far <laughs> as possible. Well, according to the records, um, in the third century AD, during the Roman occupation, there was a division of Moors who came over, who were part of the Roman army, and who I suppose we could say was like the, the earliest black presence in Britain. In terms of the musical history, the black musical history of Britain, I think a really important key strand that we see is the black presence in the military. Mm. So this confluence of migrants and people from around the world in a military setting for the simple reason that music has always accompanied conflict and battle is one of the great ironies something as beautiful as making music accompanies something as awful as killing other people and and, and being destructive so in um in regiments you have uh, drummers and you have horn players and according to the records there were they were officially called the negro tambourines tambourine that word meaning drummer tambourine which also relates to tambourine and tambourine which i think is a scottish derivation as well that was used too so we, we find that throughout the centuries um particularly from the early 16th century you have this very famous he's not a drummer he's a horn player a trumpeter called john blanky who is actually on this famous scroll at Westminster, he was part of the court of Catherine of Aragon, and he was a trumpeter. At the same time, you have the Black Moors of Scotland, as they were known, who also have these tambour lane or tambourine players. And then you have engravings, mezzotint engravings, showing Negro bandsmen playing drums and playing horns. Um, the other thing to bear in mind as well is that you, you have obviously the reprehensible event of slavery and black people having access to instruments through that as well. You have the wars of independence with America. The promise that was made to um, um, slaves who sided with the British that they would be free afterwards if they came to, um, to, to the UK, which is what happened. Again, several of those, uh, many of those slaves they played drums, they played um, violin or fiddles. So the three main instruments associated with black people kind of throughout the 16th, 15th, 16th century, going all the way up to the, the 19th really, are the violin or the fiddle, the drums, and also the, the horn, the trumpet. But even when we look at, say, an instrument like the drums, I mean, it's, it's a very generic word, drum or tambour or tambourine, call it what you will, that in itself reveals a history of migration and a history of the influence of abroad. Because, I mean, it has all these really, really interesting um, terms that are applied to it. The tambourine was also called the Jingling Johnny. And that derives from Shagana, which again goes back to the Moorish history. You have the nakera, which became the naker, which we call today a kettle drum. Again, that tells us about Arab and Moorish history influencing Europe because it permeated Spain, Portugal, and then eventually the UK. So it's, it's not just the presence of black people, it's also the history of instruments as well, which tells us a lot about how the multicultural aspect of our country goes such a long way back. And the, the that multiculturalism was understood and to a certain extent um, celebrated or, or at least 
known Kev you think in, in other words in, in as opposed to the iconography being one of exceptionalism you know here's uh, a, a, a a black musician and that's that's a, a rare thing actually what you're saying is there is a uh, th there is a continued presence and I, I obviously a, a compromised in, in all sorts of ways but nonetheless an, an understanding that uh, of a of a multiculturalism in let's say the 16th and 17th centuries in terms of who of who the musicians were yeah there's definitely a recognition of black musicians if you think about the people that we've already discussed george bridgetower obviously in the 18th later you have samuel coleridge taylor the other person who's very very significant who's not directly related to london but we should mention nonetheless is joseph emedy who was based in Cornwall, a, a hugely significant figure in the Falmouth Philharmonic Society. But you also have these street musicians as well who were well-known buskers, one in particular called Black Billy Waters, who was known in, in, in the West End, who, who would be there with his fiddle. You know, again, that, that, that speaks of a time when these instruments were common and you had black musicians playing them and they were recognized. And when Black Billy Waters actually died, there was a huge um, funeral. Uh, the procession went right through the streets of London because he was known and he was respected by the people who heard him busking in the streets. Kevin, in terms of um, the agency of, of black composers and a published record, uh, wh when does that start to happen? The, the publication of, of music by, by black composers, whether it's Joseph Emedy or uh, Charles Ignatius uh, Sanchez, does that, does that begin to happen in the 19th century? Well, I, I think the very significant figure is Samuel Coleridge Taylor. If you think about the huge impact that he made and the, um, the immense popularity of Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, you know, which which became this annual event at the Royal Albert Hall, which drew and, 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 huge and audience. Essential, an essential part of that participatory oratorio tradition all the way exactly. through the early decades. Of the it, it really chimes with what Leanne was talking about, this this kind of more populist aspect of uh, a performance which has a high musical standard, which nonetheless is very inclusive. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why it managed to draw these huge audiences. It obviously appeals to the imagination because of the story of this uh, Native American romance, etc. But also Samuel Coleridge Taylor as a black composer who is really laying down a marker, who studies at the Royal Academy of Music, who is championed by various other composers as well, who is referred to as the African Mahler, and who significantly makes connections with African-Americans as well. He tours America. So there, there's a really interesting story there. You have um, a Black Britain um, of Sierra Leonean and, and English heritage who makes his name in Britain, who goes to America, who's received very warmly by African-Americans in particular because they know politically that he represents something very, very important. And that is, let's not forget, this is still a time of inequality. This is still a time of widespread racism in terms of thinking, whereby black people are perceived as being inferior. Because he's proving the contrary through these um, compositions, through this success in the very, the very high, the upper spheres of European classical music, he's seen as a positive role model to black America and he's welcomed with open arms. And he, he's a sensation when he's in America as well. But as I, as I argued on a few occasions, you know, I think it's still important to recognize that he was seen through the prism of European music. You know, he's referred to as the African Mahler. He's not a black Brit, you know, the idea of a black British community then is still incipient. It's still in the early stages. So he, he is somebody who's very, very significant in terms of really giving us a foundation and saying, OK, we have black British, uh, a black British presence in classical music. We have the records. We have the compositions. More to the point, we have a very, very clear understanding of the impact that it made on audiences at the time. I, I mean, in terms of um, the, the black British influence um, in the later 20th century, mm. the Windrush generation, all of the other genres of music um, that are that are made, um, yeah. that are 
uh, that become part of uh, London's musical story in, in I mean in, in every in every possible in every possible weekend I know it's a lot to to, to sum up but but in the sense of are there patterns that you can trace in terms of uh, how those cultures are, are brought from other parts of the world here how they become simultaneously you know more defined as those traditions and yet also become as the story of, of music in London has always been you know become yes. part of become London's music too yeah th there are definitely patterns I mean one of the significant ones is the arrival of African-American entertainers, in inverted commas, and artists as well, who, who will have an extended run doing a particular production or performing in a venue, maybe go on to um, Europe and other places. Some of those members will stay behind. It's like the, the ones who are left behind. So um, the Southern Syncopated Orchestra, who were here in 1903, Mm -hmm. performing this amazing show called In Dahomey, um, featuring people like Sidney Bechet, the, the, the clarinet legend, you know, the, one of the founding fathers of, of jazz from New Orleans. He would stay on in London. He actually gave lessons in London. The story is that he, he bought his first soprano sax in London. Um, later, you have the likes of Paul Robeson, arriving in the 20s in 1927 a hugely important figure who who brings his interest in folk music in gospel in blues and collaborates with welsh choirs ends up being you know this iconic figure in wales and then of course you have the the caribbean and african communities who do, do they do several things they bring recordings with them so they bring Calypso recordings, and then you also have Calypso singers. Lord Kitchener, Lord Beginner, Lord Invader, all the lords from the, the, the Windrush generation. And then the jazz musicians who came after in the 50s and 60s, these very, very innovative players like Dizzy Reese, the trumpeter, Joe Harriet, the saxophonist, Sheik Keen, another trumpeter who was also a poet. And you, and you see that continuing throughout the ages, throughout the decades. So musicians arriving in search of work, musicians arriving because there were opportunities in Britain that were denied them in America. Because in 1948, you had the British Nationality Act, which made it um, very easy for people from the Caribbean to travel to England, whereas the Americans were tightening up their immigration laws because many of the musicians actually wanted to go to America. That was their destination of choice. But America's kind of restrictive immigration law happened to be our bonus. That happened to be our, our boon, our gift, because you, you had many Caribbean musicians who in fact, even before the wind rush in the, in the 20s and 30s, you had musicians from the Caribbean like Sam Manning, you had the big band leaders in the 30s who also became popular, uh, Leslie Jiver Hutchinson, uh, Ken Snakehips Johnson. You had, and I suppose this is a slightly a darker side to the story as well, successful black entertainers and cabaret, art, cabaret artists like Leslie Hutchinson, who um, were, were really embraced by the upper crust of British society, who apparently um, he had affairs with royals, etc. He was he was somebody who, who had a huge amount of success. Yet at the same time, um, when he was at the peak of his popularity, he couldn't use the front door of a hotel in London. He had to use the side entrance, which again chimes with the experience of Ellington at the Cotton Club. He's playing at this establishment, which he, he you know becomes this this hotbed of musical innovation. Yet it's a whites only club. So at that point in time, you have to bear in mind that there's this embrace of black music, but not necessarily a love of black people. And that's part of the story which we can't rule out. In, in terms of, I mean, the, the carnival is in, is in your book title um, yeah. and uh, let's say the Tutor movement, uh, those moments in which the, 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 the inclusivity of formerly immigrant communities to extend out, to become part of not only London's story, but you you know you feel absolutely essential part of everyone's identity who who lives in London or even even who visits London. You know that yeah. association between that essential, vibrant uh, multiculturalism, but just all of those all of those teeming voices. I mean, Kevin, how, how do you 
but nonetheless, you know, identities are still a, a, a key a key part of how those, those events and how those how those traditions, how those ideas are are seen. Where, where do how does how do those stories work out in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? Well, carnival is a, is a really really interesting phenomenon. You have to to realize first and foremost that it's a political event. You know, we think of it as uh, the, the day where everybody lets their hair down and you have a great time and you and you dance and you've got steel bands and all the rest of it, but Carnival, certainly in Trinidad, was a battleground. It, it, it was where the, 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 the former slaves fought for their right to be seen as citizens and to develop their own culture. And it was banned several times by the, um, the British government, by the colonial authorities, because it was seen as something that was subversive. And it is subversive in its, in its very nature because the, the, one of the key aspects of carnival is that you had the slaves mimicking slave masters through through the costumes, through the mask, through the gesture. It's I mean it's it's a fantastic example of the confluence of music and theatre. It's theatre and performance art. It's 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 very complex. The the tradition of masking, the tradition of um, of people walking on stilts. The, the tradition, the whole tradition of, of making costumes. This, this really has become an integral part of culture in Trinidad and the Caribbean. I think the, the, the beauty of Carnival as, as we've developed it in the UK is that it really has become inclusive, as you say, regardless of whether you're black or white, it belongs to you. It's very much a, a, a popular phenomenon. It belongs to the people. Yet again, we've got to point out that at the moments of extreme racial tension in the in the 70s and 80s, Carnival became again a battleground between black youth who were being persecuted during the sus laws, who were being harassed by the police, and the local authorities who were trying to clamp down. So it's always been this point of tension as well. So I, I, I think it's something which is quintessentially British because it reflects that it can reflect the mood of the population. You know, where, how do we feel about ourselves? How do we feel about migrant communities? How accepting are we? And how do, how do we feel now about the commercialization of Carnival? That's another part of the story as well. And the fact that it's to a certain extent being appropriated and being taken out of the hands of the black community that created it in the first place. So that, that's, that's another story. You know, we'd be here for hours if we were talking about that. Okay, well, we will be here for hours. I mean, this is the, the yeah. this, this series, and precisely these questions are going to be an essential part of all of the experiences that uh, that we go through musically uh, in the in, in the year at King's Place, but also absolutely all the conversations that urgently need to happen around all the, all of those all of those issues uh, you've raised, and above all, you know, highlighting the huge centuries, indeed millennia long history of uh, black musicians in this case, immigrant musicians in general, uh, to London's musical life. Kevin Legendre, thank you. It's my pleasure.